Welcome everyone to this new episode of Kuno Talk by Kuno Tech. And today, again, we have a guest you, most of you will know meanwhile, because he's been on the show already two times before. And by that, he's the, he's the most, uh, the guest that, that joins us most often so far, apart from Chris, but Chris doesn't count. It's, um, I don't even try to pronounce it correctly. It's Petros <laughs> Deligianis. He loves uh, yes, the German he pronunciation. nailed it. Amen. How are you doing? Hi. How are things? It's really good. Everything is good. And it's really great to be here once again to have a chat with you. And we didn't have that for quite some time. Time is passing so fast. The last episode we did was when I was in Athens with you, or somewhere close to Athens, we had the, the workshops for search and rescue, and we had a, a recording while driving about puppy selection and variable reinforcement schedules. So what has been happening since then? What did the last year made you do? Well, quite a few things, actually. So indeed, last time we had this kind of chat was in a search and rescue workshop we organized here in Athens. And it was a fun chat in the car. So it's even more appropriate for a podcast that people usually listen to while driving. Um, yeah. So that was fun, indeed. So when it comes to my company, Operational K9, we still operate in Greece and Europe. And we continue to organize seminars and workshops with uh, distinguished professionals from Europe and other countries. So we continue to host seminars for, for sand detection, search and rescue, or bite work. And even this week, we are having a new bite work workshop with Marcin Wyszynski from Poland. Um, Marcin is a really interesting person. It, it is a retired Grom operator, and he will try to teach us some things on selecting and training biting dogs for service, but also for sport. Okay. So apart from this, uh, let's say, domain, we continue to expand our online training courses for professional dog trainers and behavior consultants. We place lots of emphasis on courses that provide a solid theoretical background on behavior analysis and also more practical advice on how to create behavior interventions for common canine problems. So this mm -hmm. is a large part, actually, of what we do every day. And in the meantime, we continue to train our own detection dogs for projects mainly in the conservation sector. So we are Great. actually trying to establish in Greece uh, the first monitoring programs, actually, that will involve the use of uh, scent detection dogs for endangered, endangered species and some other interesting projects that involve uh, fatality estimation for bird and bats in wind turbines. So overall, it is <laughs> quite a full schedule. So one of yeah. the yes, one of the interesting stuff that also have been happening is or is basically um, I managed to complete my masters uh, this year on animal science, which is an interesting topic that we'll be glad to discuss more about. Great, yeah, and for sure we will dive in, into that topic in a few minutes. But before that. Since you have Operational K9, it was quite a new, it's still a new company or a young company, but last year it was like brand new. And what has changed for you as a, as a business owner? Do you have a different target group? Do you meanwhile have other trainers that work for or with you? Who are you targeting? How, how does your, um, yeah, business work look so, like? 
uh, our company, Operational K9, is brand new. So we, um, we managed to complete one full year very few months ago. So it's still great. in the foundational stage. So far, it is going great. But since it is a, a company that, for a large part, I run myself, and given all the other things that I need to be able to do during a workday, what has changed, I can say, is my prioritization. So um, right now, because the day has only 24 hours, and um, I strongly need to prioritize things. I try to use the, I think it's called the 8020 uh, model or something like that, which means that I try to devote um, most uh, try to devote some of my time to projects that have significant benefits uh, for the company, both financially and also uh, when it comes to the development and upscaling of the company. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our target group still is uh, professional dog trainers, professional dog handlers, but also dog training enthusiasts that want to take their training to their next level or learn more about the science of behavior or even start training their own dogs for um, any kind of service, whether it's detection, tracking, area, search and rescue, or anything related to them. So Great. this is uh, how it is going so far. And we continue to establish cooperations and a network of professionals with whom we cooperate on a regular basis for our different uh, projects since mm -hmm. we have quite an uh, expanded range of services right now. Nice. Um, a, a colleague or a, a person I know who who run businesses in Greece for quite some time. She's originally from from Germany, I think. Ragna, you know her, I think. She reached out to you. Yes, we've met indeed. And. She's she's a really nice person. She's very in, she's a, an enthusiast, and so she told me to, or she she wanted me to have a business in Greece because she said it's like for for foreign people to start a business in Greece. There are many benefits, tax wise and, and stuff. Um, and of course, the idea would have been cool to 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 have that because I I have no clue actually. She she tried to explain to me how many years um, a startup would be tax free, etc. But how is it actually for uh, for you as a as a as a born Greek? Um, what are what is the tax system looking like? How many percent VAT do you do you pay on on stuff? Well, it depends um, on the type of company that you have uh, that oh, you own. Okay. So. Um, I own a private company. Um, I think that's how we can translate it in English. Um, so for private companies, of course, we need to place a 24% um, VAT on all services okay. and products. That's uh, for sure. That happens everywhere. And then there is some tax on the profits of the company. Sure every year so this for this kind of company the tax rate is 22 percent and it is uh, stable so whatever okay. money you make even if it's one euro or one million euros you will be taxed at 22 percent right now and this type of company offers some other advantages especially for us that we regularly deal with large organizations or even states. Um, however, many people opt to create another kind of uh, company, which I'm not sure how to translate it in English, but and let's say a free translation would be a personal uh, company. And in that case, the tax rate is not fixed, but it is variable. So for the first, okay. let's say, 10,000 euros, you're taxed 9%. And for the next 10,000 euros, you're taxed like 15% or something. And then mm -hmm. it 
continues to increase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But overall, I would say that now it's easier to own a company in Greece than in the past. But of course, okay. um, <laughs> it depends on the amount of energy and work you're sure. uh, really devoted. You're going to devote on that. Sure. Yeah, it's it's very similar in Austria. We we have like the, the basic taxes <clears throat> of twenty percent on our services and products that we sell, except for dogs actually, because dogs are living animals are taxed with ten percent, which is quite interesting. Mm. Yeah, but that's that's what it is, and it's hard. I think it's I think the system is is quite unfair for small businesses like us. Because we're pretty much working <laughs> for paying taxes, and I, I really love what I'm doing, but some sometimes it's just it sucks, right? <laughs> to to yes. give away so much money, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, probably we, we won't change it. Indeed, sometimes we look at the statements and we say, "Where is this all this money <laughs> that we?" we supposedly made <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, one of the reasons is exactly taxes yeah 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 it's strange and yeah but let's not talk about politics <laughs> or taxes um let's get back to the topic how did you met yes. uh, malsin malsin as you said he's a, a former com operator which is the military special forces from poland Indeed. How did you meet and why so, do you invite him? Yes. So I first briefly met Marcin in Sweden, in Skinskaderberg, if I pronounce that correctly. No, um, you don't. You, you pronounce it as <laughs> shitty as I pronounce your name. <laughs> Perfect. So um, like a true European then. So, yes, I met uh, Marcin in Sweden and we just had a brief meeting and I had the opportunity to watch him work with dogs, which I particularly enjoyed. So afterwards, I had a dog that I needed to prepare for a biting crawl and I turned to Marcin for help. So we had actually some online classes where he tutored me on how to develop this dog for a biting crawl. And I found uh, Marcin's process very animal-centered, dog-friendly, if uh, uh, for a better term, and very systematic. So I really enjoy working with people that have a systematic way of training, and they can clearly explain what uh, the different different actions can, um, how the, our our actions can affect the dog in which ways. So this made a really good impression to me. And since um, bite work workshops from people with military or police experience do not happen regularly in Greece, I thought that it was a great opportunity for other people to learn more about yeah. this kind of training and expand our repertoire of uh, training skills. So. This all came down to organizing a workshop, and we will be having participants from uh, dog sports, but also private security and some uh, service dog handlers. So it will be a very interesting and diverse mix of people. I really look forward to it next week. For sure. I'm, I'm sure it will be great. And like we're, we're, basically doing very similar stuff and also we are targeting very similar groups of trainers and handlers and i really enjoy these mixed groups of participants from authorities military police customs border patrol whatever and um, private companies and as you call them dog enthusiasts I think there is so, so much value in that. Having people with different motivations going to, to spend some time together and, and share knowledge and try out some new, new things. Because they have to, many of them realize that none of them have, we, we have this German saying, 
that we eat wisdom or no one had no one ate wisdom with a spoon you know um but but some people think they did especially some some of the older ones or older semesters that are thinking in a box that they can't get out of their box and enlarge their horizon but but i think i have the feeling more and more people are doing that and we've realized that in the past few workshops we did um in germany and switzerland and austria that that more and more people are getting more interested into the service that others offer and i think that's one of the big benefits of social media because before social media this information wasn't shared that easily right mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to to what you say to the to the workshop afterwards. But I'm sure it will be great. Yes, for sure. And as you said, um, it's really great to work in diverse groups, because the more we work with people that are similar to us or have similar experiences to us, the less we learn, I suppose. So, the older we get. The less, um, let's say, uh, the less uh, open we are to new experiences with other people that have significant differences to us. But if we usually make this step and try just to have a taste of something new, the likelihood of learning new things will probably increase. Yeah. I think this needs to be trained. You know, I think um, cur curiosity yes. can be trained. And I, I really hope yes. that, that we, we stay open to that. Definitely. It is a trait that, uh, or a behavior that can be saved like any other uh, instrumental behavior. And also, there are, of course, some individual differences between humans. Some humans are more open to new experiences and some others are not. So it's the same with dogs. Some dogs are really open to exploring confidently new environments, and some others are not. Of course, we can save this behavior up to an extent, but there are indeed individual differences from the genetic makeup of each person that we cannot oversee. But that's another, but that's also another interesting topic. discussion. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So. Tell me something about your <clears throat> master. Are you now master Petros Deligianis? Yes, master of puppets. No. <laughs> so, yes, I have finally said that I have uh, fulfilled or all obligations to be awarded a master of research in animal science. So, this um, master's, I completed it in Hartbury University in the UK. And I have come to realize that many people are not aware of what a master of research is compared to a master uh, in science, for example. So the difference in this kind of master's is that for the largest extent of uh, the module or the program, um, the student needs to conduct research. So a large part is uh, individual study and the largest part is a research project or more than one research project that the mm -hmm. student need to design, organize, grant, be granted ethical permissions for and execute. So in the end, this results in producing a paper or a report summarizing the research and their findings of it. Nice. And how long did it take you to, to achieve what you have achieved? So this uh, took a little bit more than 12 months. And in these 12 months, I, as you already know, I organized a small study on olfactory generalization in detection dogs. And, and we, will, we will talk about that in a minute. Uh, what I thought mm -hmm. is interesting is that you started this at a, at a UK college. Had, had, did you have to go there or, or was it just a, 
an online Yes, job. I had to uh, go there. Yes, I understand. So I had to go there and participate in uh, some classes and courses. The faculty was very accommodating, so I had the opportunity of uh, participating in many of the classes online. Mm -hmm. And um, overall, I can say that it was a great experience because animal science is a very wide topic. So mm. while studying there, I had the opportunity to delve into the world of exotic animals, which was mm -hmm. something that I had not really uh, studied in the past. I had the opportunity to learn significantly more on animal welfare and specifically animal welfare when it comes to working dogs or service dogs. And it, I think the, the best asset of studying in uh, this kind of institutions or in studying uh, your master's is that you're actually able to meet people from different backgrounds that somehow have a similar interest in science to you and you can gain a lot from their own experience and knowledge. So some of my, uh, you can say, co-students were people from the British Army Veterinarians, veterinarians with extensive experience on managing really large uh, facilities of working dogs. Okay. And they were profoundly interested in uh, how to establish, let's say, welfare guidelines for these kind mm -hmm. of animals. But also other people that have different backgrounds and work with endangered species, farm animals, and it goes on. So this has been a very, very enlightening experience, I can say. I would definitely suggest anyone to pursue something like that. Huh. That sounds great. Not to get too deep down the rabbit hole, but what, what was one of the biggest light bulb moments concerning the animal welfare topic um, considering working dogs? Oh. <laughs> I think that anyone that has... It's a, it's a topic that influences our community worldwide and we're all talking about it and we're somehow all all is, is not the right word but you know what I mean many of us are having a, a skeptical view towards the future because so many so-called animal lovers and politicians who are far away from the topic making decisions that influence the work that we do. So I'm really interested in what you found out and maybe what changed your mind or, or your, your point of view on something. So I think that anyone that has uh, tried to investigate a topic can understand how chaotic it can be talking about animal welfare. For example, most people cannot agree on a common uh, terminology on what exactly is animal welfare. So let mm -hmm. alone uh, how to measure it. And it goes on like that. So I think that one of the light bulb moments was realizing that different people, not animals, have very diverse perceptions. And there are significant cultural differences on how mm -hmm. we view working animals. And surprisingly, these uh, cultural differences uh, are not only... only contained between different countries, let's say. So for example, me as a Greek dog trainer might have a different perception on uh, how to evaluate the welfare of a working dog compared to you, who is an Austrian dog trainer. But um, it is interesting that depending on anyone's background, we have different views on the topic and some are grounded or on real evidence and some are not. So, for example, mm -hmm. there are uh, quite evident differences in the perception of working dog welfare when it comes to the United States and Europe, but also when it comes to police and military working dogs sometimes in the same country. Mm -hmm. For example, in uh, Greece, uh, which is an example I can talk about, military working dogs are never allowed to leave 
the military camp. So they live in the military facility and they do not live with their handler. Very often, they have more than one handler compared to police dogs that only live with a handler at their house. So you see that military and police in the same country have different perceptions on how to, what is the optimal way to house uh, dogs. And this, of course, will have considerable effects on the welfare of its animal. And many times, not the effect that we assume it to be. So, for example, a very interesting study that I cannot cite for you right now, but perhaps I will be able to find later, Mm -hmm. investigated the effect of kenneling dogs that were previously living inside the house. And they had different indicators of stress in order to find out what was the effect of kenneling. And as you can assume, when these dogs were moved from the house to the kennel, there was a considerable increase in the stress they experienced. But as the time passed, so after a few weeks of living in the kennels, their stress levels, let's say it simply like that, were not considerably different than dogs living in the house, which for me personally (laughs) is something really hard to grasp from my understanding of how a dog should live in a human family. And it goes on like that. So I think that animal science uh, has uh, has long looked into farm and productive animals, but also it's a very important domain that can help us uh, further develop the working dog industry in lots mm-hmm. of ways. A, a very interesting example. And I think sometimes we I am having hard times talking to people about different uh, causes of stress, etc. And, and of different individuals and, and their different perceptions of of stressors etc and and the interesting part is as you said also people and cultural differences but even in the same country we are all having our own truth caused by how we live and what communities we're in so someone exactly. living someone living in the in the capital in the city center having all those traffic noises 24-7 traffic and people and, and I don't know, all kinds of smells and dirt um, might have the, the same low stress levels as someone who lives at the countryside. But if you would turn it over and exchange their habitats, they would probably just freak out and after a few <laughs> weeks show some kind of habituation to their new habitats. That they live in so it would make sense of course great indeed so the study that you talked about that you did is it all theoretically or did was it also with uh, practical aspects so it was an experimental study so we had the practical aspects and some practical implications, perhaps, I would say. What was the the, the full title again? You said um, olfactory generalization and detection dogs training with real targets and compared with dogs that were trained with GetSend. Yes, so the title is, the full title, let's say, is olfactory generalization in detection dogs trained with GetSend odor carriers. So... Um, we investigated what I think it is a hot topic nowadays, which is yeah. the use of training aids for detection dogs. Yeah. And there is lots of background on that, um, if that would be interesting to discuss. Go ahead. Yes, perfect. So, <laughs> starting with generalization. Generalization simply means, or at least stimulus generalization, means that different stimuli, different events, come to evoke or elicit the same response in a dog. So in the context 
or in the context of detection dogs. Olfactory generalization simply means that different odors make the dog exhibit the same response. So, for example, a passive indicator behavior on a target. Olfactory generalization is a crucial topic specifically for operational detection dogs. Because when we train a dog for explosive detection, for example, we use maybe a certain amount, a certain quality of an explosive material that has been manufactured in Austria. And it is extremely unlikely that this dog in his or her operational career will ever encounter the exact same material in the field. So all kinds of materials will have some variations that might have to do with the differences in their manufacturing, the differences in their composition, the differences in how they are packaged or concealed. And very interestingly, a very recent paper so that uh, the material that we use to conceal a target might actually significantly affect the odor profile that is actually available for the dog to detect. So when we say odor profile, we basically discuss the different volatile organic compounds or VOCs, as we say, that are available for the dog. And these are basically some compounds that are in the gas state, so they are gaseous. And these compounds, when the dog is sniffing, they enter the nasal cavity. And these contain the information to the dog for what exactly the dog is sniffing. And at least this is our understanding so far on how olfaction works with dogs and other animals. So different materials, for example, an explosive that is manufactured in Greece, might be produced from different uh, raw materials and might be manufactured using a different machine and might be packaged in a different way compared to the same exact explosive material like a bar of TNT that is manufactured in Austria. And sure. unfortunately, experience has indicated that when dogs are trained with TNT that is manufactured in Greece, and solely with this kind of material, they are extremely unlikely to alert on the presence of a bar of TNT that is manufactured in Austria, for example. So this is why olfactory generalization is critical for operational detection dogs, because it is not only about searching and locating, it is also about identifying the target odor. And the target odor will be sometimes significantly different to what the dog is trained on during his training phase. Mm -hmm. So this is the current issue that we are facing in uh, almost all detection dogs applications. And given the very limited amount of information that we have on that, or at least um, the very limited amount of information that we had the previous years, it is not a topic that it is usually discussed on detection dog uh, circles. So I always find myself among detection dogs that discuss how to make the dog search very intensely or for a long duration of time or for, I don't know, what kind of characteristic of the search behavior. And these are equally important. But rarely do I find myself in a circle of detection dog trainers that discuss how to more efficiently prepare the dogs to actually mm -hmm. alert on the presence of the target in the field. Yeah. So this is a subject that has long been, uh, let's say, cast aside in our circle. And I think this is extremely dangerous. Well, depending on, on for sure, depending on the, on the odors that you will train your dogs for, because when you compare it, for example, with narcotics, drugs, etc. For example, the police has more possibilities in really training with what they actually find. Mm -hmm. At least, at least from from the countries that I know that where we worked in, 
Um, also, these dogs have a high rate of finds in their deployments, and obviously that works. But explosives, for sure, are a, a very good example of something where it's hard to it's hard to find out who will build some IEDs or who would use any industrial made explosive and where from would it be shipped or where would it be built or prepared or constructed so i think that's a that's a really hard topic especially for explosives for sure also in other branches of detection but especially mm -hmm. for explosive detection dogs and we we've yes. seen it on, on workshops that even from the same country but different states in the country and the dogs would not show indication behavior or any kind of change in behavior when finding or not finding um, the, the samples of the others. Because obviously there was yes. something significantly missing. And just because we label it Semtex or TNT or TATP, it might just look or smell or feel different. And that's such an interesting topic. And we're talking actually about this a lot because we, we, as humans, we are thinking in very, of, obviously in very different categories compared to how dogs think and realize their environment. And we just put names on it and, and think it's the same, right? Also, we think, oh, this is a dog toy. My dog is supposed to like it. Probably the dog <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just just thinks, well, what do you want with this strange looking rubber ball? No, but I think that's a very, very important uh, question that you worked on there. Um, so what yes. does it or, or, or did you want to add something? Because my question would be, where does the get sent play its role? Yes. So. I'll just add something to what you already said and then answer the question about uh, using GetXent in this study. So I think that olfactory generalization is a very interesting and important topic, mainly because uh, we people avoid talking about it um, because there are, there's a very limited uh, number of working dog programs that actually test for generalization to novel target varieties. And some of the programs that claim to test for generalization, they do it in uh, using some procedures that it is impossible to tell if the dog generalized. And when I say generalized, that the dog promptly indicated, promptly alerted to a novel target that he encountered for the first time. Or this is simply a product of prior reinforcement history with this variety. But we will discuss more a bit uh, in a while, I suppose. So we definitely avoid talking about generalization. And then we do not know how much of the targets available in the operational theater our dogs miss. So our dogs might find very frequently and, st and still find only a fraction of the available targets. And there is no way that we can tell that in an actual operation, most of the times. But we can actually find this data conducting experimental research. And this is why this kind of research is important. And I think it will continue to be important for our community in the near future. So what about GetXent? Well, as you said, especially with certain targets like explosives, there are specific challenges with uh, storing, moving the targets around, or giving them to dog handlers to take them at home and train the dogs with them. So there are significant safety concerns, whether the target is explosive, infectious, toxic, or can be very easily um, be initiated by fire, and it goes on like that. So. Using the actual target substance is currently the gold standard of training detection dogs. But due to these concerns, there are other um, 
kinds of training aids that have been used for imprinting and also training detection dogs to search. Some of them are known as pseudo training aids. And to put it simply, a pseudo training aid is uh, manufactured by analyzing what are the volatile organic compounds that are found on the headspace, or let's say on the air above an explosive target. And when we analyze what these volatile organic compounds are, we create them, um, let's say, artificially and put them inside the product that we can then distribute to dog handlers to train in a safe manner. So this is how usually, but not always, pseudo training aids are constructed. And I would not want to take any sides on this question, but there are uh, peer review studies that uh, explicitly have indicated that the use of pseudo training aids did not lead to generalization to the actual target stab steps, both for explosives and narcotics. But this is an other topic. So where Getzen comes into play? And why, so why, do you and... Think, why do you think still, why do you think is that the case? Because um, when we have the, the, I call it the source of odor, like the, the real target, um, because it has so many packaging odors, um, um, you know, stabilizers that, that make it a physical object um, or is that the reason why the, the pseudos are lacking of a function or is the, is the reason a, a different one? So I, I have my opinion the truth on is, this. Yes, yes, I understand. So the truth is that one way to enhance generalization is to provide as many different and diverse odor pictures as possible to the dog. And this is one way to enhance generalization. So I would say that even if one uh, pseudo training aid is a very good replication of the odor profile of the actual target that they used during their analysis, it is only a replication of one. Uh, actual target. And this by itself will not lead, will definitely not lead to generalization. So the best scenario, and I think this number will be an exaggeration upwards, will be that a dog trained with one uh, variety would generalize to 50% of other targets, which is basically the same as flipping a coin, which is not a percentage that would be acceptable for a practical application. So I think this is one reason, let's say. The other reason has to do with, um, and yet this is not my opinion, this is uh, the results of prior studies. Uh, it has been shown that certain products lack repeatability in their manufacturing, which means that when you buy the specific product, from the X company, which contains, let's say, the order of TNT, and you buy the exact same product from a different batch, these two products that should be identical often um, are different. And this does not allow for reliable use in uh, dog training. And Makes last sense. but not least, which is the most important factor, is that actual target substances will have different odor profiles on different stages of their decomposition. So when you take, let's say, a fresh a gram of TATP straight out from the oven, it will unfortunately smell different compared to the same exact target an hour later or a month later. So it's even more important to actually train with all these kind of variations. And this is not possible when you only use one product or one variation in your mm -hmm. training regime. 
Okay. Having said that, sometimes there are some applications that pseudo training aids appear to be quite effective, such as in the detection of bed bugs. But this is another kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. So a different uh, type of training aids is what we call sorption aids. And these are kinds of aids that uh, have the capacity to take in volatile organic compounds by adsorptions with a D or absorption with a B. So Jetsend odor carriers are in this kind of category. And this kind of category is very interesting because theoretically, at least, can give us the opportunity to take a screenshot of the odor profile of a target at different stages of its, um, let's say, material life or decomposition. So using a sorption aid, we can take a screenshot of how a TATP, of how one gram of TATP smells zero hours after its manufacturing, one hour after its manufacturing, and one month after its manufacturing. So this will give us the opportunity to present the dog with all these variations of the target that we are looking for and will help us prepare the dog more efficiently in order to generalize to novel targets in the field. At least this is the theoretical component because there are some limitations with the use of sorption aids. So one of the mm -hmm. very common sorption aids are cotton balls, for example, that have been widely used and have been practically applied for na narcotics, for gas, for explosive in many, many units around the European Union. Other sorption aids even involve pieces of carpet. Uh, sometimes it's cotton gauze. Some other times it's a metal stick or metal tube, and it goes on. So it's almost Almost everything that has the capacity to absorb and or absorb odor can be used as a sorption aid, which, as it is appears obvious, creates lots of possibilities for creating effective drain gates, at least theoretically. However, when we use a training gate, the end goal, as we already said, is that after we train the dog with that, the dog should be able to start generalizing to novel target varieties. And the only way to do that is by analyzing via gas chromatography and mass spectrometry what exactly is uh, the odor profile of this train gate, and also by doing canine trials. So basically by training dogs using the training aid, and training another group of dogs using the actual target substance and comparing their performance in recognizing new targets in a very easy odor generalization task. I have so a question. This is why this... Yes, of Petros, course. Let me interrupt. So the, the GetXent group or the training aid group, was it GetXent? Um, in my research? Yeah. Yes, so one group trained using GetXent and so did one you, group trained using the actual target substance. Did you buy blank tubes and impregnated them with the target order and then you had the target order that you used for impregnation had for both? So it, it was the same odor that the, the dogs were looking for or was it already impregnated? by precision explosives or whomever. So we impregnated, we purchased blank tubes and impregnated them ourselves and also uh, used some tubes as controls. Mm -hmm. So the targets that we used in this research was one very single, very simple substance called one bromooctane. So one bromooctane is a single component chemical. It's just one component. You can't get any simpler than that. Mm -hmm. And it's considered to be a universal detector calibrant for applications in working dogs. And it's a kind of chemical that um, it's not hard to come by if you're a research institution. 
So one of the targets was one bromoctane, and the other target was a variety of smokeless powder, which is a common explosive and propellant using firearms, basically. Yes. So why did we choose one bromoctane and smokeless powder? Well, one of the main limitations on using sorption aids is that we do not know enough about how efficiently they can absorb other molecules. So, for example, I have one material, let's say cotton, to make it um, <laughs> less, to make it simple, and I put it in an airtight jar with uh, smokeless powder. So, smokeless powders um, usually contain a large percentage of nitrocellulose and several other components like uh, flash suppressors, like dyes or other kind of additives that give the explosive different kind of qualities. So these other um, these other components also contribute to the odor profile, which means yeah. if we could analyze the headspace of a smokeless powder, it is likely that we would not find only one component, but probably five or more. The thing mm -hmm. is that these different volatile organic compounds might be absorbed or adsorbed by the cotton ball at different rates. So if I place a cotton ball in the jar for one hour and then remove it, maybe I have more of the first component compared to the actual target substance because this component attaches to the cotton very quickly. And I have less quantity of another component that it is in higher quantity in the actual mm -hmm. target substance, but it, it does not attach to the cotton ball really well. And this might even change if I leave the cotton ball there for more, for like three, four hours or 30 hours. So this is one of the limitations of sorption aids. We are not very sure how the volatile organic compounds react or, um, uh, yes, basically react with the matrix, with the material of the sorption aid. Mm -hmm. So th in this study, we investigated using a single component chemical, which is just one uh, volatile organic compound and a more complex odor profile that was created by smokeless powder, which was double based. Mm -hmm. So basically, it contained nitrocellulose, also some nitroglycerin, and many mm -hmm. other stabilizer dyes, flash up, and it goes on like that. So, in this study, we used initially we used 10 dogs. Uh, so, as you understand, it is a small study. Yes. So this was the, the, the study with the cotton balls versus the the real target. And when you put the cotton balls to the real target order in the in the airtight jar, they did not mm -hmm. touch each other, or did they? Yes. No. So the method of uh, impregnation was yes. because that's not important direct for, for the people to understand. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, no, no, uh, actually it's, it's a good point because many times in some platforms I find people saying that ah, a cotton ball or any, something, anything like that can only absorb the actual target by placing it in direct contact, mm. which is not the case. So one way of creating this sorption aid is just to place them in the same airtight jar, not in direct contact, with the actual target substance, because many times this would defeat the purpose of using the sorption aid uh, in exactly. the first hand. And uh, then after some time where the sorption aid has absorbed and absorbed uh, the volatile organic compounds, we remove it and use it to train the dogs. So we use it to try to replicate the other profile of the actual target substance. Mm -hmm. Is that clear now? I, I think it's clear. Perfect. Perfect. So, talking more about this research, it was a small study and it was a follow up from a pilot study that I done using actually cotton balls. So, in this research project, we used GetXent other carriers uh, that were impregnated with one bromoctane or with uh, one kind of uh, smokeless powder variety. And because of the small sample size, we only had 10 dogs and eventually it got nine. One dog had to withdraw from the study. The same dog, so for example, Ignaz, would train with 
the actual substance for one bromoctane and the get sent cube for smokeless powder. So every dog mm -hmm. should train with both. And mm -hmm. if the dog trained with one condition for smokeless powder, then the reverse condition was used for the other target, namely one bromoctane. This was in order to basically increase or sample size or increase the amount of data that we can get from these dogs and also compare the different uh, targets on the same dog, which eventually we found out that it was impossible for several reasons. So, as always, we just started imprinting training and after the dogs could reliably alert to the presence of the training target, we started using variable reinforcement and we introduced novel distractors during training. So, it is extremely important to introduce novel distractors uh, during imprinting because far too many times I myself in the past have trained dogs not to alert on the target that I am I want them to, but to any novel target that it is presented in the lineup or set wheel. One very common mistakes, mistake in our circles is that we only put the new thing that we want a dog to indicate and train them on that. And then we put a new thing, which is a variation of the target, and we want them to indicate on that. And if then we just put any nonsense new thing on the lineup, most of the dogs will go there and indicate immediately. Because the yeah. rule that we have taught them is not find smokeless powder, it's find the new stuff that's on the scent wheel. And find, the more we imprint the using the this kind of methodology, content. yes, exactly. So the more we imprint like that, the more the false alert rate on the scent wheel increases. That's why actually we, we I was smiling because we had this, this topic yesterday. Uh, it, right now we're having the last module of our detection dog handler class. It's already the seventh, the fourth group. And we started in the very end of the training with the odor conditioning. And we used to have empty scent wheels. So we started this odor conditioning with the scent wheel to set up a, a certain context for the dog. Okay, let's go back to the scent wheel. Right now we're doing odor recognition or odor conditioning. But the funny thing was that we kept away the distractor sense, even though we, we were using pairing of a known substance and a new substance, um, we had an empty, empty boxes around. Meanwhile, we, we always have them filled. And I think also important to mention is that we replace the distractors as well as we replaced the target sense, uh, the known ones and yes. the new ones, so that the dog is not only looking for the, the new added subject or, or, or um, object, but he starts to understand to search for a specific odor profile. Which yes. you... As you said. Yes. Go ahead. Sorry, go on. No. I, I've so, just as had you some said, brain as you said, it's important that the distractor or the novel distractor is actually novel, which means we have to change these distractors pretty soon. So, a novel distractor is something that the dog has not encountered in this context again, and that means that we need a great number of novel distractors for almost every repetition on the scent wheel or, um, or lineup in order to be very successful. And this is really easy actually to accomplish because if you just go into a supermarket and you find and you just buy the 10 first things from the plant division, then the 10 first things from the sweet division, and then the 10 first things from the tools division and goes on, it's very easy to build a bank of novel distractors that you can use in your training and vary them constantly. So this is an important aspect of imprinting, something that we have introduced to our training uh, plans as well. So getting back to how this uh, study was conducted, 
the smokeless powder was hot gun hs6 or something like that with a double base powder and the one bromo octane was diluted in uh, in a mineral oil a kind of oil that is regularly used kind of um in this kind of research projects so the dogs were trained in one percent volume by volume of one bromo octane which means that in 100 m milliliters of the target only one milliliter was one bromoctane, the target that the dogs needed to learn. So the interesting thing that we try to do here is that we did not try to find out if the dogs generalized to different varieties of one bromoctane, because there are no different varieties of one bromoctane. One bromoctane is a single component chemical. It's impossible to have different varieties of a single component. Mm-hmm. So what we try to do is to see how well the dogs generalize to different concentrations of the target. Mm -hmm. We know that dogs have difficultly, when trained with one concentration, to generalize to other concentrations that are much higher or much lower. And one of the very, very funny, let's say, but also dangerous aspects that led to this kind of research was that an incident involving a large quantity of explosives placed inside a van that detection dog teams failed to alert to. Mm -hmm. That means that these explosive detection dog teams that smelled the van, they definitely smelled the scent or the odor of explosives. But the concentration, let's say the amount of odor available, was considerably different to the very, very small quantities that usually these teams are trained on, like 20 to 40 grams. And these dogs did not alert on this very large quantity, Hmm. which obviously has some considerable practical implications for the use of explosive detection dogs in actual operations. So we try to see what would be the effect of using a training aid on the dogs generalizing to different concentrations of one bromoctane. And when it comes to smokeless powder, we tested whether the dogs would generalize to different products of smokeless powder, which were actually purchased from the same shop. So the products were from different manufacturers, but Mm -hmm. from the same shop. So that means that if you would try to make a pipe bomb using a smokeless powder, and you went to the shop and you bought three different products and build three different pipe bombs. Unfortunately, the dogs would, in best case scenario, only find one of the pipe bombs that you would have created yourself. Find it. Due yeah, to the yeah. lack of generalization as shown in this study as well. Interesting. So, yes. So after the training phase, we proceeded to the testing phase and it might sound very simple to test for generalization but it is rather not. So there are different ways that people have tried to test yeah, generalization. Give, give me a break. So when you talked about the training phase, so in this training phase, you trained with different intensities of all. But did you also train or with... concentrations, uh, yes. Yeah, or concentrations. And, but did you also train with the odor being boxed or conservated somehow in, in, in the plastic or in the in the bomb p- pipe bomb or did you just train it in the sand wheel or in the lineup in a glass or metal can so with no additional distracting odors at source so the objective was to test whether the dogs would promptly alert to the novel varieties, and therefore this only happened in the context of the scent wheel or the mm-hmm. lineup. And the different variations that I previously explained were used, because when we try to do a free search, as we say, so the dogs searching a room for a novel variety, then we introduce another problem, the searching for the target. So sometimes we will not be sure whether the dog has actually found the source and decided not to alert or 
the dog has not found the source because the technique of the search was not adequate to smell the available volatile organic compounds. So by mm -hmm. placing these only in the context of scent wheel or lineup, we decrease, let's say, the number of problems the dog has to solve. And therefore, we get more reliable data. Mm -hmm. But of course, the next step of this research is exactly as you said, to see what would be the difference in performance of these kind of dogs in a free search when trained with the training aid or the actual target substance. But this is something for later. So, when it comes to testing generalization, some people, well, the, the basic problem is that if your dog finds a novel target in a scent wheel and the dog indicates and you reward them, then this first alert, this one trial, is your only measure of generalization. Because if you place this target again in the lineup and make your dog search, now your results are biased because the dog has at least one reinforced trial with this target. So mm -hmm. you do not know that this is a measure of generalization or this is a measure of the prior reinforcement history of the dog. So this is the issue of reinforcing dogs for finding novel targets during generalization testing. Some researchers uh, in the previous years have decided to test generalization by never reinforcing dogs for finds during the testing. And this obviously means that um, the dog's um, performance might start to decrease during the testing procedure because the dog will not be reinforced for alerting on novel targets, but will also not be reinforced for alerting on known targets in order to not create this kind of expectation between novel and trained targets. So mm -hmm. this is not a very effective procedure. Another procedure that also has been used is to basically try to reinforce all um, responses to novel and um, trained targets, which, as we said, cannot provide an accurate measure of generalization because only the first repetition or exposure to the novel target will actually give us any information if the dog generalizes or not. Mm -hmm. So an alternative approach that have used by other researchers and has been replicated in the study by us was to use a variable or intermittent reinforcement schedule during training. And during testing, some of the trials contained the trained target, some of the trials contained the novel target, and some trials were blank. So we decided to not reward the dog for any alert on novel targets, but also not reward the dog for a certain percentage, around 50%, of alerts to the trained targets. So the yeah. dog would indicate on the trained target and sometimes would get a reward and sometimes not. And the dog would alert on the novel targets and would never get a reward. <clears throat> this kind of procedure does not create the expectation or does not condition an extinction stimulus with novel targets, which means the dog does not associate novel targets with no reward because no reward is a condition that also happens on the known training target. And this procedure allows us to expose the dog to the same novel target again and again and again. So each dog was exposed to four novel targets three times during the testing phase. And therefore, we had a more accurate measure or a more accurate percentage of out of three times, how many times the dog indicates on this specific target. On a specific known target or unknown? Or novel or unknown targets, mm -hmm. yes. So this is our measure of generalization. How likely the dog is to alert on a novel target in a number of repetitions. But then a novel target that fits into our category of uh, smokeless powder, but that was mm -hmm. not yet trained with. Exactly. Okay. So, so when it comes to smokeless, smokeless powder, powder from company A, 
And in this test, you use the novel smokeless powder from Company B. Yes. More specifically, we train the dog using a double base smokeless powder from Company A, and we tested the dog on three other smokeless powders from three different companies. Some of them were single base, meaning containing only nitrocellulose, and some were double base, containing nitrocellulose as well as nitroglycerin. And the results were surprising, to be honest, or unsurprising for people with uh, some experience in olfactory generalization. So tell us, what did you find out? What were the results? Yes. So before delving into the results section, it's important to say that this was just a master's project with a limited number of dogs. So the statistical analysis or our results did not reach statistical significance, meaning that we cannot extrapolate these results to all working dogs. That means that we need to replicate similar studies and amend their limitations with larger sample sizes in order how, to have how, an how accurate should, idea. How, how, how big should the number be of tested dogs? This is something that, um, unfortunately, canine science has been uh, tortured by, meaning that many research, uh, many studies use a very limited number of dogs, similar to ours, which is less than 10. And this rarely can produce statistically significant results. So the researchers many times try to increase uh, the number of trials in an effort to increase the statistical significance. But this is not important. I would say that a recommendation for designing canine trials would be to have at least 20 dogs because this would be oh, 20 okay. as, a number, as a sample number would be something that you could encounter in other scientific disciplines. But of course, during the designing phase of a study, we do some um, ad hoc power analysis, some uh, statistical tests that actually inform us how big should our sample be in order to have statistically significant results? So this is something that mm -hmm. we can calculate on a case-by-case -case basis. So given that this study did not produce statistically significant results, it was interesting that our results had great power, meaning that we're, there were significant, not significant, that's a bad word, but there were considerable observable differences between the groups. So when it comes to the one bromo octane condition, the mm -hmm. Gertsen group and the actual target substance group performed similarly. So there were, uh, um, there were very small differences in the performance. And when it comes to um, talking about these differences, we could say that the Getxent dogs were not as good, but that was not very big as a difference. They were not as good in generalizing to large concentrations, mm -hmm. whereas the actual target substance group was not very good at generalizing in very small, let's say, concentrations. And this, is, this makes sense because one of the, not limitations, basically, but one of the characteristics of using sorptionates like Getxent is that they have a specific quantity of volatile organic compounds, and they release these compounds uh, in the herb space. So after a while, the sorptionate will be depleted. There will not be any other volatile organic compounds on the aid to be released to the environment, which means that as we start using the Getxent tube, we start training the dog on X concentration. And as the time passes and we continue to use the same tube, the dog will progressively experience lower and lower concentrations of the volatile organic compound. And this could probably explain why the Getxen dogs were really good, like 100% generalization for all dogs, when generalizing to 0.01% concentration of the actual target substance compared to the real target group. Mm -hmm. 
This is also something that was partially validated by the use of a photo ionizer detector, but we can discuss about it a bit later, hopefully. So when it comes to the smokeless powder group, well, then the results were a bit more complex. So okay. there it is the differences between the get sent and the actual target group were quite um, observable, quite visible. So was there the, the same, get was the same nine dogs, and that's interesting, right? It was the same nine dogs, the ones with the yes. real target bromo octane and get sent smokeless double based, and the other way around. Yes, exactly. Okay. So when it comes to the smokeless powder, smokeless powder. The Getxent group showed a 0% generalization to one of the variants used, so the less than 12% generalization to another variant, and less than 50% generalization to the third variant used. So overall, we would say that generalization was not successful in this group. Mm -hmm. In the actual target substance group, dogs generalized to a bit more than 75% to one of the variants, a bit more than 55% to another variant, and a bit more than 66% uh, to another variant. So the difference in the generalization rates is visible. The difference is large. Yet, it is not statistically significant. We have mm -hmm. to take this, this into consideration when interpreting these results. So we cannot be completely sure that this is an accurate depiction of the reality. Okay? Having said that, the differences were quite big, but there were also differences between the same groups. And this is a very interesting aspect of generalization. So I recall that Jens Frank actually was one of the participating dog handlers in this research because Jens was extremely kind and allowed us to use the Scandinavian Working Dog Institute facilities to conduct this experiment. And I recall that one of his dogs, he did not show any alert behavior when one of the smokeless powders used. And because it was the first dog to be tested on smokeless powder, I was very curious. So I took the bottle containing smoke, the smokeless powder, I smelled it. Then I took the other bottle containing the training powder and I smelled that too. And I said, wow, the dog is right. This doesn't smell at all like the thing that the dog was trained. And we passed it around and most people said, this does not smell at all like the training powder. And then we said, ah, it will be interesting if the other dogs also do not alert to this powder. I can tell you that this dog was the only dog that did not alert <laughs> to this powder at all. So the other dogs uh, considered this powder very similar to the training powder, which is very interesting. And this highlights that when we have complex mixtures of volatile organic compounds, dogs will learn a specific package of them. They will learn probably a specific combination of these volatile organic compounds. Mm -hmm. And we have no clue what this combination will be. So when we present them with a different variety of this target odor, if this combination of volatile organic compounds that they have been imprinted to exists in this new target, maybe they will alert to. But if this specific combination is not evident in the new target, they will not alert to it. Mm -hmm. And this is why in many of their studies that uh, research olfactory generalization, we have this kind of outliers, we have this kind of differences between dogs, simply because dogs, due to genetic factors or prior experiences, will be more sensitive to specific compounds of the odor picture. And this makes, the, um, makes things quite complicated, as you can imagine. So, 
having a final thought about results, it is also evident that these dogs that were trained with only one variety of the actual target substance, they would be quite dangerous to be deployed in the operational theater, simply because some of the dogs alerted just above 50% of the times on novel variants. And as I already told you, some dogs did not alert at all to some varieties, yeah. which means that if you had constructed a pipe bomb using this kind of explosive, these dogs would not have found it. And this has profound implications on the use of said dogs for operations. Therefore, generalization testing, similar to what we conducted in this study, it's extremely important to have a good idea of how likely our dogs are to alert to novel targets in the field. And it is now um, <laughs> my impression that no working dog program is complete unless there is a systematic way to measure generalization to novel target variants. Otherwise, the implications of not doing so are extremely dangerous for dogs, operators, and the public, particularly when it comes to explosive detection dogs. So, overall, when we look at the performance of the get and you group and the actual target substance group, we could say that the dogs using the Getxen group for one bromo octane were really good to generalizing at different quantities uh, or concentrations of the odorant when trained with Getxen, but they were not as good as generalizing to different varieties of the smokeless powders in that condition. The reason for that, we cannot possibly know. It would be great if in this study we had some uh, analytical chemistry input, which unfortunately we did not have. So to analyze the odor profile of the Getxent tubes, the tubes impregnated with smokeless powder, compared to the odor profile of the actual target substance. Yeah. And then we might be able to interpret some of these differences. But since this was a very small scale project, we could not manage to get our hands on uh, laboratory equipment and funding for that. However, here comes the limitation of certain sorption aids. If this smokeless powder used for training had, uh, for example, five basic components in its headspace, maybe the amount of time that we used to impregnate the tubes allowed for three of these components to be um, impregnated in the tube and therefore to be available for the training of the dogs. And maybe the other two components were not absorbed at the same rate. So this is the first thing. And the second thing is that when the Getxen tube starts to release these in the environment, probably the volatile organic compounds that are very volatile, so they have a great tendency to move around in the environment, they would be released first, and this could a bit mix up the odor profile that the dog experiences when smelling the jet tube after varying times during training. But we can't really know, or at least this research cannot enlighten us on this aspect. So I could say that these are basically the conclusions of this study that we conducted last year. And these conclusions should be interpreted with caution due to our results not reaching significant. However, they highlight some quite big differences that might have practical significance when training dogs. So imagine if this was not a research project and it was a military working dog training facility. On the one hand, when it comes to one bromoctane, all dogs both Gelxen and real target, would be able to perform at similar levels. So they would be able to start searching systematically and uh, continue their training journey. But when it comes to smokeless powder, the one group trained with actual target substance 
will be significantly ahead of the training. So there are practical implications in our results, but we still need to interpret them with caution. So this is not an advice for everyone to use or not use sorption aids or to use them in a certain way or for certain targets. More studies like these need to happen in order to also have a greater database of how any kind of sorption aid interacts with the volatile organic compounds of interest. And some of these studies are already being designed and implemented. So in our study, we used a very simple chemical and a more complex mixture. And I already know that uh, some other very knowledgeable people from the University of Vienna, if I'm not mistaken, they are designing a similar study where smokeless powder and a more complex mixture of cadaver would be uh, compared. So we will be able to see how gelatin tubes and other sorption aids perform for varying degrees of complexity of odor profiles, if that makes sense. I hope I, I, my English are competent enough to explain this um, in a simple manner. No, for sure, but, but these scientific topics are not easy to, to follow. For everyone who listened, maybe maybe we can share the link to your paper, or is it a, is it a, a public peer reviewed paper? No, it's not yet uh, publicly available, but I could uh, definitely send it to people that are interested. So okay. you can just place so, my so email and your... I can email it. Yeah. So you tell me which of your email addresses I can add to the show notes, so people can reach out to you. Um, later on to definitely check this um, so knowing that this should be viewed with caution and that the group of dogs that you used was still quite small what is your let's say not non-scientific view on the results like like not the the scientist but the dog trainer how would you use these training aids, especially get sent? Um, if you were to train a an explosive detection dog? Yes. So this is not <laughs> an easy question to answer, but I can only tell you my personal opinion on that. So first of all, the reason we use Absorption aids is because we cannot use the actual target substance. And sometimes this makes us comfortable in not using the actual target substance, which is a problem. Okay? So, at all costs, or I would say as frequently as possible, dog teams should use and train using the actual target substance and varieties of it when it comes to the composition, manufacturing, or quantity or concealment. I can say, or it seems from our research that using gelatin tubes for very simple compounds could be an equally effective method of training dogs. But maybe if, when the complexity of the odor increases, we probably, I think that we should not expect equal performance between the gelatin and actual target substance. Having said that, Already from our research, it is obvious that the Getsin tubes group, uh, when it comes to smokeless powders, they achieved some degree of generalization, even if it is a small one. Which means that maybe training with the Getsin tubes could actually win some training time, will decrease the overall time. So maybe if there are working dog programs that they do not have regular access to the actual explosive, Maybe it would make sense to imprint the dogs using Gelsen tubes impregnated with a range of explosives, as wide a range as possible, and then, with the first opportunity, imprint the dogs on the actual training substance, the actual explosives, which would now take considerably less time. So, 
Although if the imprinting, let's say, is not complete using the get accent, we can significantly decrease the training time or the training time using the actual target substance. So that would be my recommendation to use the actual target substance as frequently as possible. But if that's not possible, then you might be able to use sorption aids. Try to purchase a great variety of them for many different sources to give your dog the opportunity to generalize to new targets. Mm -hmm. And with the first opportunity, imprint on actual target substance, which will take a significantly fewer amount of repetitions to do. Great. And, and that's the thing with, with studies and the results, of course, the result depends on the question asked or the questions asked in the very beginning, because these training aids bring many benefits with them. Not only Getxen, we use Getxen, we like it and we, 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 we see that it works for a bit of it. But there are many other benefits in, in working with these training aids, such as being able to hand it on to someone who is not having the license of, of, of owning and carrying it around, to put yes, it at a, exactly. place, at a public place where it would be way too dangerous to like hiding an explosive training aid or non-explosive training aid for explosives at a, at a, at a, at a kindergarten or, or somewhere, <laughs> a children playground, you know? So those are the other big benefits, I think. In, in using these these training aids and for sure having the real source will will always be a very important thing it's interesting what you have and what you have claimed and and talked about and some of those things we ran into throughout our training so dogs that used to train with real sources had difficulties in indicating uh, the Getxen tubes, probably because they were used to a, 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 a more intense amount of odor or a bigger scent picture or whatever the, the scientific way of describing would be. On the other hand, we were able to imprint dogs on the on the Getxen and then have them on the real target odor quite quick because they they knew they knew. The the odors that, that they were looking for. And the other thing was the problem of thinking of the handlers because we sold some narcotic tubes that were imprinted in the US ordered by, like the order was given from Getxen to Precision Explosives, who is one of their main, um, 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 how to say, partners in the US. So we sent out the narcotic tubes that were impregnated in the U.S. And of course, these narcotics are different from what you find on German streets, right? But still, mm -hmm. some of the dogs would indicate on these tubes and some just wouldn't. But then that's a, an issue of the generalization, not an issue on the product. Because you know how people work and they try out something new with a dog that should be able to perform, then the dog does not perform and they blame the product and not their lack of training. So maybe that's also some, 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 some important thoughts in the end of this very interesting sneak peek into your study that there are always so many components to consider and also for us practitioners to but to consider how to use the information that we gain from studies. Yes, indeed. And it's really important to stress out the individual differences that exist between dogs. And this is why testing is particularly important. So even in our study that we observed these group differences between the Getxent and the actual substance when it comes to smokeless powder, if you look at the data, at least one dog in, um, in two of the novel targets did not indicate at all to the novel target variety. And this dog, uh, and these dogs actually, were from the actual target substance group. So at least one dog in, these, 
in one of the varieties from the real target group did not indicate, and at least one dog from the GetSent group indicated on this variety. So if we, had, if we were a small working dog program, and we only had these two dogs to compare, we would say, ah, the GetSent dog performed better than the actual target dog. But this is why we need large uh, sample sizes. And this is important to realize that generalization is a dynamic process. It's not something that we take for granted. It's something that we need to cope for, and it will be different for different dogs. So there is no much sense in uh, training for generalization. A dog that has 100% generalization in 15 different varieties of smokeless powder but it makes total sense to train for generalization, a dog that has less than 90% uh, likelihood of alerting to novel smokeless powder varieties. And the only way to understand that is to test it. This is why I personally believe that generalization testing should be an explicit component of the imprinting training, but also of the regular assessment and evaluation of working dog teams. Because mm. generalization is a dynamic process. Even if you have achieved great generalization and you train for the rest of the year, for the next 12 months, using the same explosive compound that it is uh, given to you by your, um, by your agency, then your dog's generalization gradient will narrow eventually. So you will start losing generalization. This will continue to change during the whole dog's career. So it's particularly important to account for these problems by continuously trying to find new sources of training aids to try to use explosives or narcotics or whatever is your target substance that your dog has never trained on. Mm -hmm. And it is important that you test your dog regularly for that. Great. Great. We should we should uh, consider making an episode or even a webinar or something concerning the quality control of detection dog because we we have this included in our instructor classes mm -hmm. and also in the in the detection handler classes like a, a monthly quality control and the monthly calibration. So this would be very interest, interesting. And then, for example, by using the machine, the detection dog training system, and get sent tubes with uh, sources from different countries, uh, from different factories, etc., and so on, this would be a blast, you know. It, it could mm -hmm. make many things quite easy using the machine of having the possibility of training a dog in a short period of time or in the same period of time outnumbering the repetitions of a, of a conventional training with a, with a sand wheel or, or lineup. And on the other hand, having the possibility of using the VOCs of targets that you would never get access to because you can't travel with them. You can't bring them from, I don't know, Central Africa to Europe or from uh, from the Middle East to Europe, but you could imprint mm -hmm. them and then send away those those impregnated tubes. So I think there are many, many, many new good ways to how to say to elevate our detection dog training to make our dogs more bet or better in in their detection capabilities. And for sure, um, you're you're doing a, a great job in gaining information that all of us can use. You're the man. You're too kind. But uh, yes, that's great info that you just provided. And I too think that using uh, automations in the imprinting training. Um, solves so many problems that we have with handler interference, with the uh, handling of uh, targets, etc. So I think that automated systems, like the one that you uh, regularly use, is the um, 
app. It, it's the only way forward for imprinting. At for least sure. in these cases that we can work in an isolated or laboratory environment, because sometimes imprinting will happen in the field and this makes things complicated. Yes. Also the machine mm -hmm. gives the possibility of creating different test runs and if those test runs to every owner of a machine, you know, and because they're like mm -hmm. 22 machines worldwide, and many universities have them, many in France, some in Germany, and many authorities. So we should really consider use this network for these studies because then you would have like 100 dogs probably. For, yes, for yes. Like this. So this would be really interesting. The... And I, you should, you really should come over to my place finally, and <laughs> I would, I would show you the machine. Maybe we can figure out how to organize a, a workshop or a seminar with you. But that would mm -hmm. be a, a cool thing. Yes, that will be great. Talking about odor is one of the <laughs> really enjoyable things for me, to be honest. And <laughs> Yeah, using uh, cooperative, let's say, science obviously has many benefits. It will be great to, uh, in the future, that all these practitioners cooperate in uh, large-scale studies and investigation. That sounds like a great idea. Petros, is there any anything else to mention concerning your studies, your master, or yourself and the company? Otherwise, last but well, not least... I... Yes, just a small acknowledgement of the people that have been extremely helpful uh, with this research. And um, one of these is my academic supervisor, Sheena Taylor, and also Jens Frank from uh, the Swedish University of Agriculture for facilitating this research with providing uh, his workspace for us for several days. And I would also really like to point out, and I think this will be a very interesting people for you to talk to in this podcast. Um, and this person is Thomas Gustafsson. Thomas Gustafsson is a Swedish chemist uh, and dog handler, narcotics dog handler, with, with extensive experience in the defense industry. So he volunteered and was a dog handler in this study. Um, and he was very helpful discussing about other things. As and I Gustav say. with F but or with V? With F, Thomas Gustafsson. But I can send you his information later so you can maybe contact him. So also Thomas had the idea of using a photo ionizing detector, basically a handheld machine that we use to measure the quantity of uh, volatile organic compounds in the environment. And this was basically a pilot um, application for this project. But maybe this uh, Thomas idea might solve a significant issue we have with sorption aids, meaning we do not know for how long the sorption aid can be used because it starts getting depleted of volatile organic compounds. And we right now do not have an easy or not very, not extremely costly method of knowing if our Getxen tube or cotton ball still contains the target. So we did some, a small experiment using this handheld detector and our results might, from the canine trials, might validate its use in order to find out how much odor is still available in a training gate. And maybe that is a very interesting topic to discuss about in the future. But... Definitely. That's all for me. Great, great. And this would be very helpful also finding out in, in the practical world and in the field, is there still odor on it or not? Exactly. Um, on the other hand, our experience, just to make a point on this uh, for now, our experience was, or at least I tried always to not getting rid of the VOCs on the training aid, so I just didn't use it for that long. But sometimes yes. it just happened. And then the dogs just 
started not reacting to it anymore because it smelled of mm -hmm. nothing or of of distractor sense from the environment and then there is not a like it's not a big problem then but depending it would still be very smart to see like like on a battery when you hold it on both ends and you see okay it's still yes. 30 35 exactly. percent of energy in it right so good um as you know i always uh, have this question from my previous guests and that's why i asked you if you were listening to my um last episode and obviously you did not <laughs> listen till the end so i will i will ask you the question in the name of dr stuart hilliard who is another great guy um for sure you would enjoy spending some time with him talking about dogs and training them as well because he's still um he's still on the field working dogs which is impressive as i always think so um you could have made some thoughts on it but now you need to be just a little bit quicker <laughs> and the, un unfortunately he like he's he had an intro for these questions but oh. i will do it without his intro without the background story so his questions mm -hmm. what do you think about the issue of can a dog give consent? Do trained dogs give consent? And should I limit myself only to things, behavior, training procedures to which the dog gives his consent or her consent? I will copy paste this and put it into the chat. If they read the chat. I an easy one, it seems. <laughs> yes. Well, well, it appears that it is more of an ethical question than an than a practical one. Yes, sure, sure. But it's uh, the ethical question, and that's what we started with today, right? Of the animal welfare. And and it's a very present topic. It's also an interesting topic. It's it's hard to grasp. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you see so, the chat? I, I I typed the questions again into the chat, so you you don't have to remember them. You can read. Oh, them. chat. And yes. take your time to answer this. Just don't do anything stupid. I think this is a like these questions could fill another another episode, right? We could talk about this for a long time. For a book, actually. Yeah. But uh, yes, consent is a hot topic, I could say, from an animal science perspective. Right now. So I just took a minute to organize my train of thought in a manner that would be comprehensible in English or hopefully uh, that's the goal I started to use AI for those things and it works <laughs> really good 
Yes, that's Helping me sure. to translate things, right? In a very fast way. Yes. Um, the disruption of AI is everywhere. And soon it will be to dog training as well. Not on the business aspect or our aspect, but the dog aspect. I think the following years will be a huge disruption in the way we view training. Because currently we view training in a human-centered, let's say, way. So we expect the dog to sit and stare at the target because that's how we can understand that there is something there. But the dogs have other processes of understanding that something is there that we have no clue of. And now that we have the ability to analyze a huge amount of data from dogs searching, alerting, indicating, and also we can use different kind of sensors to measure other not publicly visible response of the dogs. I think this is a great field that will be developed in the years to come and hopefully change things in our industry. But that's another discussion. So talking about consent and animal training is an extremely <laughs> difficult topic, at least for me. So I will do my best to answer this question. And the first thing I think that we need to clarify is what consent means, because there is not a lot of consensus on what consent means sometimes. So let's say from a human medicine background, consent would be the voluntary participation of an autonomous person, a person that is capable to make decisions for him or herself, uh, to participate in something. So using this term and incorporating in a, an animal welfare context has certain limitations. And for years now, we, do not, we have not assumed that dogs or animals are able to provide consent. And this is why we do not usually ask dogs if they want to participate in Petro's research project, but we ask the dog handlers, so the owners and guardians of this dog, to provide informed consent to participate. So currently, I think the status quo is that we do not acknowledge that uh, non-human animals, at least uh, non-primates, can uh, have explicit ways to provide consent because we lack, probably, the ways to communicate them to communicate with them on what to expect of a procedure, but also probably because some species, and I cannot talk about the dog because I do not have this kind of information, but some species might also lack the cognitive capabilities of providing consent because of the procedures that are needed to provide consent. So mm -hmm. let's say one prerequisite for me or you to provide consent is that we need to understand or know what we will happen. So we need to have a standard expectancy of what is going to happen. So for example, if I go to a tattoo studio and say, I need to have a tattoo, the tattoo artist will tell me, there is likely that you will experience some pain when uh, I start tattooing you. So I have an expectation of um, feeling pain, so feeling aversion, and I have the capability of saying, nope, no, thank you, this is not for me. Or I have the capability of saying, yes, I understand that I might feel pain, which is not nice, but I still consent on having a tattoo. So this is maybe a naive example, but this is where we actually need to use, in my opinion, the concept of consent in animal training and research. Mm -hmm. So we do not usually expect a dog to provide consent, but in uh, the internet, you can find a whole lot of information and blog spots on consent training for dogs. And usually this kind of training refers to husbandry practices or uh, cooperative care practices on how to do certain procedures that might be, that might cause discomfort to the dog um, 
while trying to minimize discomfort and prepare the dog for this kind of contingency. But still there, there are certain issues. So for example, cooperative, cooperative care is a concept or let's say training domain that has been largely developed for uh, using for use on animals that are really hard to coerce into doing something like animals that are held captive in zoos or animals uh, that might be uh, living previously in the wild and might right now live in a rehabilitation center. So because of the significant effort and danger in coercing these animals into cooperating with us in order to draw blood samples or checking their teeth or their paws or putting a stethoscope on their chest, these researchers, these practitioners have developed cooperative care tactics where you can see animals like tigers or bears voluntarily presenting their paw in order for blood to be drawn, or lions letting a very tiny woman open their mouth and check their teeth. And this is always impressive to me, coming from a dog training background, where yeah. most dog and cat visits to the vet do not look at all like no. this. Yeah. That's true. And that's very impressive also um, seeing them work with um, sea mammals and, as you said, yes. big predators or, or gorillas or like, like big animals that if they don't want yes. it, they, they could just crash you, right? Um, like like I, in the very first case, I think that the level of training is impressive. And I think it's great that you put this as an example of a possible consent or animal giving consent on a procedure so here where i think it starts becoming complex so one important aspect of consent is the ability of the person or the animal to withdraw from the procedure because <laughs> it's not really consent when you start not liking something and you are coerced into experiencing it if i make my point clear so for example let's say you have a bear and you using targeting, you teach the bear to put her paw out of the cage for me to draw a blood sample from this animal. And we train this animal using positive reinforcement, which is the go-to methodology for all these kind of uh, training plans. Then at some point, maybe because we did something wrong or we increase the level of aversiveness, the bear decides to withdraw the paw. There, it starts getting complicated because if uh, we have an animal centered approach, it means that this escape behavior should be reinforced. So, this means that this escape behavior should allow the dog to actually escape the aversive stimulus that we are trying to, mm. um, that we are currently presenting. And this is what happens most of the cases. But then it's a question should the animal take a primary reinforcer, be positively reinforced for removing the hand or not. Because if you negatively punish the animal by withdrawing reinforcement for removing the paw from the cage, mm -hmm. then that means that you are actually modifying the behavior of this animal in manner other than using positive reinforcement. And one could say that if you positively reinforce a bear for not cooperating, then you will likely have a bear that after a few trials will stop cooperating. And although this sounds valid, in practice, we have opposing results. So in practice, there are certain practitioners that are very skilled in this, and they continue to positively reinforce animals for, from withdrawing from these kind of procedures. Okay. And the animals but, but with still the, with the same try to... With the same reinforcer that they would also receive for staying in the procedure yes, or exactly. with a different yes. reinforcer? With the same one. And okay. one of the reasons that we think that the animals continue to cooperate, let's say, is because the, this high level of reinforcement changes some uh, emotional reactors or conditions some competitive emotional reactions Very that make them more likely to exhibit behaviors that in the past have led to 
this kind of primary reinforcers such as food. So I think it, it gets extremely complex uh, when we discuss about these notions. And I understand that different people will have different viewpoints. So I do not think that my dogs are able to consent in many things because they do not have the expectation of what's going to happen. And many times we prepare the dogs using cooperative care methods for a contingency that will not happen. Many times we prepare a dog for a vaccination using a spoon in the back and some really tasty trees in the front. But when the dog goes in the vet, he will experience pain. And this is not part of the contract so far. So this mm -hmm. would be a violation uh, of the expectation of the dog. So Probably. Yes. So I think it gets complex. So if our dog is aware of the probability of healing or being exposed to aversive stimuli and the risk benefit analysis in their head that ah, I need this toy a lot, but I will also experience pain. Um, and this risk benefit analysis, the let's say motivation to take the toy is higher than the motivation to escape the pain. Then can we say that this dog has provided consent? Probably. But I can fully understand another person saying that this is not the case. So I think it is very hard to answer this question, is, at least with very my hard. level of knowledge. Yes. Yeah, and probably said that, that makes it even, even, even harder. The, the more you know about it, the more things to consider. And, and as you said in the very beginning, the, the real question is, what's the definition of consent? And is there mm -hmm. actually any kind of consent or is everything trained and um, reward or punishment orientated, right? Yeah, it gets Very even more complicated important. if you think about... Sorry, sorry, interrupting. No, go ahead. Oh. So it gets even more complicated if you think about training uses, using negative reinforcement because negative reinforcement obviously produces appetitive emotional uh, arousal. It's a reinforcement. It feels good, but mm. it involves the use of aversives in the first place. Uh, so you need to withdraw something aversive, something that causes discomfort in order for the dog to feel good and experience negative reinforcement. So this becomes even more complicated from a cooperative care uh, or consent approach. Because I'm sure that the internet is full of people that will be able, using an e collar to condition a dog to lay on his chin while the vet does inexplicable things on his back, causing pain and discomfort. Can this dog, or has this dog, provided consent for that? Or is the dog simply under a trained contingency? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But having said that, I think that from my personal perspective, I think I have taken a lot of your time talking. But from my personal perspective, I, I generally do not approve the use of other means apart from positive reinforcement. Or um, I do not prefer the use of... Uh, other means when there is a positive reinforcement based approach that can achieve similarly effective results, if that makes sense. It but this sense. is an opinion and not a yeah. statement. But, and I really appreciate everything you said. I think it's, it's really, really interesting. And you, you mastered these questions. But to answer Stewart's last question, should I limit myself only to things, behavior, training procedures to which the dog gives his consent or her consent? It depends, I would say. Casting aside, I think what consent is, that will mean different things to different people. So if you have a pet dog and your goal when having a pet dog is to feel good with yourself by having a dog and your responsibility of it as a dog yardan is to ensure that your dog also feels well. So in that, let's say, aspect, it would make sense to limit yourself on uh, training procedures that 
your dog can actually give consent so that your dog does not want to withdraw from. So limited aversion, limited punishment as little as possible. But if you are a working dog handler, your relationship to your dog is innately unequal because your dog has no clue that the thing that he's trying to find and he will be rewarded with the ball any minute from now it can explode and kill him. So the relationship of the working dog handler and his detection dog is profoundly uh, based in inequality and in not providing the dog uh, all the information for the work. So I don't think that these dogs can actually provide consent for many of the things that we do with them. But at least we can uh, try to use cooperative care practices to diminish or decrease the aversion they feel towards everyday uh, practices like trimming their nails, uh, making them dunk their head in a water bowl to cool down and reduce their body temperature or to go to the vet and it goes on like this. Mm, so interesting. It depends would be the answer. No, I think I think this answer was great. Very impressive. You brought up some some things that I didn't think of. Um having a, a first glance at these questions and it makes a lot of sense including these cooperative cues to to this topic and as you said it's it's a it's a it's a big topic it's we could spend a few more hours talking about it and i i always try not to give a lot of my thoughts to that because the question was handed by me to you and it was not addressed to me so and we will keep it like this but what would be your question for the next guest mm. I have a moment to think of that sure So, running across the same lines, I would ask um, also a more ethical question, but with practical, um, let's say, implications. So I would ask your next participant, to what extent is it ethical to use working dogs in high-risk environments, in environments where they're basically likely to get injured or dead. Um, so, is it ethical to use dogs for search and rescue in rubble piles? Is it ethical to use dogs for infiltrating buildings and biting humans? Is it ethical to use dogs to find fentanyl? And how maybe can we balance this uh, risk? to the dog's benefit, if that makes sense. Or it makes sense. What, how, what's great, great. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great question. And I will meet this guest next Thursday, actually. It will be mm -hmm. finally again an in-person interview. I'm very looking forward to that. It will be a very interesting guest. Uh, with a background that I haven't yet had at the show. And we already mm. have more than 70 episodes, actually. So this will be a, a, yeah, a new thing. I'm so new... happy that, yes, it will be a new thing. I'm, I'm really happy that your podcast has come so far. I remember 
in the first couple episodes when uh, you started it, because we were actually talking about that. And we did uh, one of the first episodes actually together. And now it's more than 70 episodes. And yeah. I think I'm it's running. widely recognized. So that's impressive. I'm really happy for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for taking your time again. And say, your girlfriend, thank you for letting you do this. <laughs> yes, she approves. She consents for me. That's great. Um, it was a great, it was a great chat. And as I said, I will put your email address to the show notes. So for everyone who is who is interested into the the paper itself, contact Petros. Check his website. Check his. Instagram, his Facebook. I will put all of this to the to the show notes. Anything else to point out? Um, no, I think you covered everything. You can of course join our social media at Operational K9 in Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, and get up to date to the events, online courses that we are regularly organizing as well as our services for uh, professional working dog programs. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I hope we meet soon in Greece or in Austria or anywhere else. So take care. Bye-bye. Have fun training dogs. Thank you. Bye-bye. You too, mate. Good.